Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our Friday Town Hall. As we've been doing for a number of uh, months now, we have been exploring the topic of our role in uh, systemic and internal racism. We've been going through a series of progressive and guided study with Dr. Cindy Acker. We've had opportunities to share, to process, to learn, and hopefully to really um, open our perspective in a new way. So wherever you are in the journey, we certainly appreciate you being here with us and joining us today. Um, I am Kathy Leach on behalf of the Monastery Foundation and the International Monastery Council. I welcome you. I'm, I'm joined by several of my uh, colleagues and co-board members, and I'd like to um, introduce them now. I have um, Kitty Bravo with us. Kitty is the uh, an IMC board member, as I said, and the Director of Education for the Center for Guided Monastery Studies. I have Jonathan Wolf with us. Jonathan, Senior Consultant with the Foundation, author, workshop, leader, and poet. And also with us um, is Tanya Reiskin, who is our um, co-head of school of our lab school, the Newgate School in Sarasota, Florida. Then we have our special guests. Um, Sarah MacArthur Valley has been working with us over this course of the week, these weeks. She is the uh, Director of Social Justice at the Child Unique out in Alameda, California. And she has been um, helping us and, and working through a process with us. And we've been led um, over all these months by Dr. Cindy Acker, who um, is just a, a wonderful mentor who has guided us um, through this process. And we're so appreciative of you, Cindy, and, and helping us uh, learn and grow. So I'm gonna turn it over to you for now. We'll be monitoring questions. Um, you can raise your hand virtually. If we stay a fairly small group, I'll watch for hands as well. Uh, if you need a virtual hand up, you click on your participants tab and the little icon will come up you'll be able to do that. You'll also have a chat function, so feel free to, uh, we always have active chats going. We'll try to track that as well. The, the agenda um, Sarah has posted in the chat box already. And then she um, is really great about sharing the links with us that we might be uh, utilizing today. So without any further ado, Cindy, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Kathy. I would like our starting moment of silence to be dedicated to peace and integrity. There is just a couple of weeks out until election day and there, there's a heightened sense of urgency, upset, fear, ambiguity, fear over the ambiguity that is just very present in the air. And so I would like us to hold peacefulness, to hold integrity um, through this, this period of time and to just really call upon that for ourselves, for those around us, um, so that we don't take in that energy and that they hopefully will be able to feel our sense of calm because no matter what, we will be fine. Um, and so that is where I would like our moment of silence to hit this morning. Thank you. So we're gonna talk about what it means to be white today. Um, and I can't tell you that piece. Uh, so I want everyone to unmute because I wanna start by asking, what, do you, what is it for you? What does it mean to be white? Oh, wow. I think, Cindy, you should have given us like a week to prepare. 
<laughs> oh my gosh, I feel like this is a pop quiz. What are you <laughs> gonna I'm gonna take another breath and let someone else speak. <laughs> it seems to me that the that's exactly what it means to be white though. Is we, don't, we don't have to think about it. <laughs> exactly, mm. Nervera. Mm. Exactly. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. Someone else. It means noticing the few times that you feel like you're in the minority because most of the time you don't. Yeah, Cheryl, I can relate to that. I remember the first time I did some consulting in, I uh, can't remember whether it was Korea or, or Taiwan but walking down the street and having and noticing that people were turning their heads to look at me as something other and different. It's like, oh, oh, well, there you go. It was it was kind of an eye opener. Yeah, Jonathan. I, I, go ahead, Kathy. Oh, well, I was going to just refer to you, Kitty. You and I walked down a street in a very small village in uh, China, year many years ago, and we were really we were not in a tourist area and we really were the only white people. People just stared at us. It felt like we were sort of, you know, um, a novelty or something different. Um, but I'll have to say my experience in um, both China and India is that they treat me as if I'm royalty. Um, not just that I'm different, but that I must be somebody important. And sometimes that would be uncomfortable. Um, and it really hasn't been until we started doing this work that I, I really even started looking at that a little bit in a, in a little different way of not just that it's uncomfortable, but um, you know, this is almost embarrassing, but to see that I also kind of like it. You know, I mean, it's, you know, you're, somebody wants to carry your things and they, you know, they're putting you up on this, uh, as my Indian friend would say, this pedestal. And um, I've had to look at how important it is to not take advantage of that, shall we say. I was going to say, for me, I feel like, the, you know, obviously there's a difference um, more recently in how I've been thinking about and feeling about, um, you know, being white. And two things that, that, that come up for me the most, one is just, and again, there's a, there's a, I guess, a guilt that comes with it, but feeling lucky. You know, I, I think about that as particularly in terms of as a parent, and I think about, you know, how lucky I am that I don't have to worry about my teenage sons going outside and being, you know, seen as a threat in the same way. And, you know, my 15-year-old rides his bike in the neighborhood, and I don't worry that, you know, something is going to happen to him. Um, and so I've been very aware of that piece of it as a parent. Um, and then also this responsibility that I feel like, you know, I, I right now feel this responsibility to um, live up to the privilege that I have um, in being white and to, and to do something with that, I guess. So that's been kind of like very much a, a part of my thinking recently. Um, I think Fred's hand is up. Oh, go ahead, Fred. Oh, you have to unmute. How's that? Yeah, great. Um, is it correct if I'm assuming that the answers all are related to the location of the individual to answer the question? Because so that it's really how does one feel white if you're in a room with 50 white people as opposed to being in a room with 50 non-white people or if you're in China or uh, let's say any other location so that for many people 
I wonder whether or not they are thinking of their whiteness or blackness if they're not in any kind of a situation where they have a reference. Am I overthinking this or is there some kind very of- Very interesting. No, that's very interesting. Yeah. So if I, someone I who- I, I lived in um, Puerto Rico for 20 years with my wife uh, who was born there. And what was interesting is that I didn't feel my whiteness there so much as I use the term gringo because that's acceptable there. Uh, that was dominating my feelings, which may be the same kinds of feelings that people feel about their whiteness when they're in a situation where predominantly not white. Mm. I just thought I'd throw yeah. that out. Um, Margaret. Yeah, thank you um, for sharing that. I'm sorry, Margaret is next and then Jelena is, did I say that correctly? Okay, then you can go ahead. Margaret Strickland, if you can um, unmute. Yep. So I was just going to say that I think over the last year, I've felt a lot of, especially over the last six months, I've felt a lot of shame as a white person because I have suffered knowing the benefits that have come in my life to date and feel often overwhelmed by not only the tasks that lie ahead of us and sort of the arc towards justice, but how many people within my own family and my husband's family with whom I have no influence who really fully embrace their privilege and aren't interested in changing. And mm -hmm. our school, um, many, many weeks ago, our elementary teacher, Amanda, was on here. And I thought she's so eloquent in the way she states things, far more so than I feel like I often am. But our school was designed as its very purpose to work in a low income community where we're working every day to work on issues of equity in a, um, with a population of adults and students designed to bring equity to people um, from all different backgrounds with that as like a conscious part of our founding. But I still struggle, I think, with um, my own inadequacies and always articulating that well or fully. And with the people who look like me, who have so far, not that they have far to go in their journey, who aren't interested in a journey and who embarrass me as the president embarrasses me. So. Mm -hmm. And that, Jelena, next. Thanks, Margaret. Since I'm coming from a different country uh, and I've lived here for um, over 30 years, I, um, I haven't felt what you Native Americans are feeling. Um, uh, of course, I'm white, but I felt at certain points, I felt, felt something, you know, against me, not against me, directly but because i'm a foreigner i speak with an accent so it's always something else rather than just racism which is very significantly shown at these times during this pandemic and all these things that are happening in my lifetime here in america and but i feel i wanted to say that i feel that human beings we as human beings failed altogether that in the long run, we were not humanized enough to see each other as humans. And it is wonderful to work. I work at, at the school where, where there are a lot of black kids and a lot of white kids and Hispano. And, and we don't feel that. We, I haven't felt. I, 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 we talked to the parents. We talked to the kids. The kids, they had never shown any kind of anything um, until, and I was kind of afraid that during this time, maybe somebody will say something and the kids would be influenced, you know. And, and this was the first time that I came with this idea of what 
racism may may bring to in my personal life you know in my work you know and 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 uh, so i just feel that as human beings we failed so so badly and we have to do something about it regardless of politics regardless of and this is like i don't even think about these people i'm you know thinking of life in general mm -hmm. that's what i wanted to say Thank you. Thank you, Juliana. Uh, Rosa, Rosa Grant, you have your hand up and you could unmute. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Hi, everybody. So my thing is, uh, I grew up, my parents are both from Mexico, and I grew up in a Spanish-speaking household. And um, people usually will, are very surprised when I speak Spanish or when I tell them, you know, or they always assume I'm white, and I never saw myself growing up as white, you know. Um, I saw myself as a Hispanic woman. Um, and so that's always, to me, that's always, we were, you know, this summer, my sister and I were at my mom's house, refinishing the house. And in households, you know, same mom and dad, we have different skin tones, different color eyes, you know, that's for everybody, black, white. And um, someone was moving uh, furniture for us. And my sister and I were both speaking Spanish. Well, my sister was speaking Spanish. She's, she's olive tone. And then when I spoke Spanish, he said, oh, you speak Spanish too? And I said, yeah, I'm her sister. I speak Spanish. And he was very surprised. And I just thought, oh, my God, you know, I don't know. That just seemed weird to me. Um, and also, my ch I have three adult children, and they're um, biracial. And I do worry about them. I worry about my two boys a lot, and I worry about my daughter. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Rosa. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Rosa. So I am curious if someone who knew nothing about race um, walked up to you and said, so what is white? What would be the answer to that? If you needed to give them a definition, what would it be? You know, last session I was uh, struggling with the, uh, I think it was two sessions ago, with the terminology of black versus African American. And uh, I still continue to struggle with it because I wonder if as a teacher, a small boy who was black or was African American would approach you and request what kind of an identity he or she has. It's kind of like the same question, Doctor, that you're asking me as a white person, do I answer that I'm white? Do I answer that I'm American? Do I answer that my, give my religion? So I think that, that the, the, the whiteness is a, um, is the system that you've been discussing that has been imposed upon us as being associated with a race as opposed to a skin color. And it has all kinds of implications to it, which I guess I don't want to feel that I want to accept because- mm -hmm. I think I would say that's, I think race and skin color is the same thing. And that I would say, white is my race because of the color of my skin. Well, that's one of the reasons why I don't answer that question when I'm asked on questionnaires is what is your race? Because I don't know what that really means, what the implications are to it. So um, I have a problem to answer your question. I don't know what it would be if you were to ask me what is white? Fred, you bring up a really interesting point, and I'm I'm starting to rethink. Um, uh, you know, certainly from what we've learned, we know that white is a social construct. It's just a social construct. That's right? a, that's the phrase. And I think that's, that's what you were you're right. I think that's what you were coming to. So I'm processing that in a way, in a new way, and I appreciate that. Um, I I have a couple of hands up. Um, Chloe, and then Rosa, do you have your hand up again? I do. <laughs> Okay, I just want to make sure. Sometimes I forget to put the hand mm -hmm. down. Thank and then, you. And then Nervere. 
So start with, uh, I think it's Chloe. Hi, um, my husband is black. And I just to answer the previous speaker, he feels very strongly that he is black and not African American. He feels like I'm Italian American and I have a very good connection. I know where my family is from in Italy. I have a lot of connections with that heritage. And that is a privilege that I have. And he feels like he does not have that same privilege that I've had knowing where my family comes from. He feels like for him, and I know the black community is not a monolith, but for him personally, he feels like he doesn't get to be an African American. He only gets to be a black American. Mm. Very insightful, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Rosa and then Nevera, please. I was just going to say that when I was growing up as a little girl, if you asked me then what I thought white was or someone who's Caucasian or, you know, blonde, blue eyed, or, or speaks only English, I would think that they were smarter than me and my mom and dad. That's what I, that's what I thought. They must be smarter. Or they must, there's something special about them because they're on TV, they're in books. Um, that's what I thought growing up. Mm -hmm. Interesting message because that's what you saw. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Nerver? Um, yeah, I was just thinking about what a shallow um, concept it is of the, because I know for myself, I, I usually think, well, I'm not like those white people. <laughs> Or you can't you can't assume what I'm thinking or who I am because of how I look, you know. I um, and I I wanted to say after my somewhat flippant comment at the beginning of you know that um, well we don't have to think about it when we're white and I know I've been in a lot of environments where I've been the only white person and um, the one thing that occurred to me you know I. I thought it was, well, this is interesting. This is how people of color feel when they're in an all white environment, but it's not because never did I ever feel that the non-white people that I was with saw me as less than. And I think that, um, you know, this whole, and it's kind of global in a way. Um, it's not just American whiteness or, you know, European dominant cast you know the the whole the whole caste system is pretty global and and i do think that that's something that um we need to consider more often i guess and and i'm trying to get grasp grasp better than i've grasped it before um that my whiteness doesn't necessarily imply inferiority or I'm not, I have, I wasn't raised to feel or, or wasn't, I didn't get messages that my whiteness made me inferior. And the same, even though I might feel uncomfortable when I'm the only white person, um, I don't feel like people are seeing me that way. Um. Kathy, I see Sarah. Oh, Sarah, yep. And then oh. Kathleen, I see you too. So Sarah, and the, yeah, thanks. I've been thinking a lot about this, you know, and and Nevera, I, I think your your comment that we don't have to think about it, for me, that's actually truly is is the answer. And growing up, um, being being white was simply, it was the undefined part of every person in a book right? You got to learn all sorts of things about them, their hair color, what country their parents were from, how tall were they, all these other things. And the first thing you heard about any other character was either they, their, their skin color, right? So the, the, the white for, for, for me became this, that, that was the norm. That was the accepted. Everybody is white unless specified other. And I think that's, mm -hmm. that's, the, that's, a, that's the challenging part. So when you ask Cindy, if someone asks me, what is white? I'd say white is the race you don't have to define. 
because it's the one that everybody expects a, care, a, a person to be unless otherwise defined. It feels real, I mean, as we're talking about, there's, there's new awarenesses and new ways that we wanna be thinking about this or, or articulating it. Um, and I find myself getting stopped short every time I hear a description on a, on a news show or anything that gives me a specific on a black character or a brown skin character or, uh, and, and then I hear a description of another character in a, a book on tape or whatever. And it's, and there is no race or skin color or defining characteristic. And I go, oh, they're assuming I think they're white. And it was just, and I do, I do assume. So that's the, it's, it's where we have to move from, which is the assumption is you're white unless otherwise defined. And then we do define it. You know, we find we, we're, we're supposed to define it. Mm -hmm. Kathleen, if you want to unmute. Um, first, Cindy, I want to thank you for asking that question because it's, for me, it's been very hard um, to be a white person at these meetings. Um, so what is it like to be white? I feel the burden of carrying the weight of what has, what white people have done to so many groups of people, the Indian indigenous people, uh, the Africans, the Japanese Americans who were incarcerated after the war. I, my mind cannot comprehend that kind of cruelty. Um, and yet because of the color of my skin, I am part of what happened, even though I didn't live then. Um, and I have the chance to be in a, a biracial um, group many years ago of women. And we were given a question. Um, each of us were given a question to ask the partner we were with. And I was with a, a woman of color. Um, <clears throat> and she asked me, uh, what was it like to be white? And my answer without losing a moment or a second was embarrassing. Mm. And she said, why? And I reached into my purse and pulled out my Blue Cross Blue Shield medical card. And I said, I have this because of the color of my skin more mm. easily. Um, and yet, <clears throat> as a single mom of a three-month-old and a six-year-old, I didn't have insurance for good bits of time. So we could connect on that level. And I had stood in food stamp lines and uh, unemployment lines um, when I was struggling. And so we could connect on that level. And I also had a child who had been abused and I could connect on that level. And it was an amazing two, two, two hours of just real connection. And color disappeared totally because we were two moms sharing mm -hmm. real life experiences. Mm. And I wish there was more um, opportunity to do that kind of thing because, and this is meant respectfully, but, and I've loved all these sessions, don't get me wrong, but the divide was still there. You know, it was what has happened, what the history is, and it's awful. Um, and how do, we, how do we bring that together so we don't have to talk about color? Um, you know, to Sarah's point, or I forget who said it, can we just be human beings who share our human experience and support one another and help one another through it? Um, it's, it's heartbreaking. It's just, it's, it's heartbreaking to see what's happening in our country and how there's so many people who do not have what they need. Um, and I would say that's true of regardless of color. Um, but it does affect people of color much more. I understand that. So, and I worked in the Philadelphia school district for 20 years and I was the only white person at a 250 
person wedding. Um, I was the only white person at the funerals that I went to. Um, and I loved my community of color and I miss it because the people were wonderful. Um, <clears throat> so I'm all mixed up. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> you said a lot, Kathleen, and, and thank you. Thank you for, for sharing that. And, and I will say that it's a journey. It's a journey that we're walking right now. Right. Um, and it's one that we, we have the power to be able to change. It's just going to take a while. Right. And it's going to take a lot. Right. We have a couple more hands up. Uh, Malkia, welcome back. Uh, if you want to go next, and then we'll go to Marty, and we'll welcome you back, too. <clears throat> so I can't answer that question. <laughs> right there. Okay. Nor am I attempting to. But I did want to lend a hand um, in moving the question a little deeper from the surface, maybe, to say that... Um, to be white, to be non-white, um, in this construct, right, that's been set up, because we know it's just a social construct, but the social construct is so, it's like, I give you the license to live, and I give you the license not to live. It's like a license giving situation. So it's saying, if you are not white, then you don't have life, the license to life liberty, justice, or the pursuit of happiness. So the idea of being a human being who's growing and development, developing that license can be taken away from you at any moment in time, just because of the color of your skin, because you're this tone versus not. Whether you speak another language or not, or whether you're in foreign soil or not, the tonality of your skin, because we also know very bright, light-skinned people who are Black also get different licenses to live. So I will, I invite you all to look at that question again as, and look at the different licenses that you have in the social construct. That's non-humane actually for some. For most, actually, because I do think personally, and this is my personal opinion, I think the idea of inferiority, right, and superiority are both diseases, and it takes us both away from our humanity. So that's my part of this contribution. Thank you. Thanks, Melke. Um, Marty was next, and we'll go to Mike. Uh, I th it's a very complicated question to ask. And I think the answer, the complexity can be seen when you see, particularly in the far right, what people they want to consider as white. And there's plenty of subsets that don't qualify to have those uh, credentials and privileges. But I think Cory Booker, uh, I guess it was yesterday in the Supreme Court hearings, did such a, an important thing in asking the potential justice what books she's read. And so I think mm -hmm. that question and his, just the way he is, uh, really went to the heart of the of answering the question. And that is in this point in time, I think to, to be a white person and recognizing what's going on around us these last months, if not, you know, decades and centuries, but these last months, it really does require some level of self-scrutiny and self-education. And without politicizing his question beyond its obvious intent, I think the question and the answer was very reflective of what it means to be white in this country. And that's, that's really enough comment for me. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Marty. <laughs> and now, I, now I'm going to have to um, go listen to that portion of the hearing. So. Yeah, I know we're all curious now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can tell you. Basically, Cory Booker, uh, in a very uh, respectful way, essentially asked her, what has she read about race relationships? And the essential answer was nothing. 
Wow. Yeah, and, he, wow. and he was trying to make the point that if you sit on the Supreme Court without an awareness of how wow. these rules, it, it was really one of the most powerful things I've heard. He's, he, I think he's a very, very capable person. And he handles himself with such dignity and respectfulness that it was hard to miss the response of basically she's aware of commissions, reports, and so forth. But personally, she couldn't come up with a single book, magazine article, anything. And I think to me, that was uh, really the most poignant and effective way of pointing out what white privilege really is, including white privilege on the bench. Yeah. Well, wow. Especially since she's a mother of two black children. Right, which can be an easy defense, but it doesn't really mean that a person with two black children that couldn't have racist tendency, not that she does, I'm not suggesting she does, but no, you would, it would be I'm more not, aware, more sensitive, more caring about how those two children are going to be. Right, that's more but, my point. Right. You would think that she would try to contextualize and learn for her own children that she brought, you know, from, I think, from Haiti and, and you know, was raising here, and she also commented that they were quite sheltered, and I think I, my, my reaction to that was that's exceptionally naive of her to believe that yeah. that is their experience. Yeah. Um, wow. Yeah. Wow. So, I mean, that's so, that so answers the question, how woke are you? Exactly. Um, that's really <laughs> I think to ask what a white person is today, you know, for the, and whoever said it earlier, I so agree. I think there's so few white people proportionally that really care enough to dig in even slightly is evidenced by the potential justice. Uh, and so I think for the people that do care, the responsibility to be white now, what does it mean to be white is what this, your group is about and why it's so important. It's at least, you know, the recognition that there's a lot for white people to become more familiar with and sensitive to. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, wow. And Mike, we're going to you next, go ahead. Oh, M Marty, just what he shared, just kind of yeah. put up, uh, it's uh, off track, it's, it's taken me off track for what I wanted to <laughs> mention. I think all of us, Marty, you sort of shook us all yeah. up for a moment. Yeah. Because, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's easy to say, you know, it's easy to say that she's a smart, you know, any smart person can use their, their moral compass to do the right thing, you know, that what she, you know, what, what a person has read or gone through is not necessary. They don't have to educate themselves in these matters to do the right thing. But this, this is something that just doesn't seem to go away. So there's obviously a roadblock. These issues that we have, they don't go away. You have to have gone through something or there has to be a change of heart or there has to be some education. There has to be something, some kind of publication or some process that you have to go through <coughs> in order to be able to understand the issues at hand. Does that make sense? It's, it's, not, it's not okay to just say that um, um, she'd be okay because of her moral compass and that she would make it. You have to have gone through something. You have to have read something or been somewhere or seen something. You know, case in point, the, the forefathers, again, I'm always bringing them up, running, you know, the country, running from the British, trying to make a better life on the premise that the British were, had a heavy hand, right? not doing the right thing, treating us badly, taxing us without representation, and then coming here and becoming the very thing that they were running from, you know? They didn't know any better. It was like you, they were gonna make the country into what they just ran from, you know? It's amazing. So there has to be some education process. There has to be something. There has to be something that says, uh, this isn't quite right, which brings me to what I was going to ask, and that is this. Um, I hope this complements Cindy's question, but I'm just curious to know, um, is there, you know, in, in, in the, Marty spoke of a time span in the past few months, kind of around a year. Is, is there anything that, you know, my white brothers and sisters or, you know, people that are, you know, is there anything that, has anything clicked for you uh, or is there anything that you feel differently about? Was there an epiphany, a moment where you said, wow, this really is going on? Or I've heard about this. I didn't believe it before, but I believe it now. Or, or has nothing changed for you? Is, or, or do, do you things do you do you feel like things are kind of the same, or that the 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 complaints of of, of um, 
some people concerning this social construct is 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 kind of much ado about nothing. I'd love to hear if that complements your question, Cindy. But if not, I don't want to sidetrack anything. It's fine. Thanks. I'll respond yeah. back to that if I may. Yeah, Since go I ahead, and then we're going to go to Cheryl and then Stephanie. So we're going to. I'll be very quick. The reason I said the last few months, I was timing that with uh, George Floyd murder, and then all That's the. What other. I was thinking. Yeah. 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 It, because, uh, as I said, the first time I was introduced to this group, I've been so despondent over the potential for improvement in race relations because it's so endemic in, in our society for so long. And it's only uh, when Black Lives Matter, and I think those women behind it primarily, somehow got the attention of the country over the same kind of events that have been taking place. And what's happened these last few months, that's the reason... Uh, I don't know that I'm any more hopeful, but it's been the catalyst, I think, for a lot of people to reconsider that it really isn't okay, what's been going on here forever. And that's what I meant by the last few months. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, let's see, we had Cheryl and then Stephanie and then Kitty is next. Um, Mike, I would say for me, it's a series of, um, reminders that that just because of my skin color I have extra power that I, I haven't done anything for and um and one of the ones I always go back to is when I was in college I had an acquaintance who um, was granted sanctuary at our college um because he had um done something against apartheid I'm not even quite sure what he did but he couldn't leave campus without somebody there. I mean, he called it his protect. He called us his protectors, and because the South African government had threatened his life. So <laughs> this guy who was six foot two, probably one eighty, uh, you know, I was. I'm five foot four. I was his protector sometimes when we stepped off campus and it was a city campus. So sometimes to go to a class, you had to leave campus to then get back on campus. And, um, and I was really struck anytime I did it that the only reason I offered him any protection was the color of my skin. Um, I, I mean, probably my citizenship some, but really the color of my skin. And, um, and then as, um, as I've gotten older and as things have, as I've reevaluated in the past few months, as our nation has reevaluated, I realized what privilege it was to, when I had my kids go, okay, like I need more time for me and for them. And I had the privilege of putting that aside which some of my friends didn't. I could put race aside and they never had to. And for me, that's, I consider that a huge privilege that we don't think about and don't, or we don't talk about, so we don't think about. Um, that I think as white Americans, we do a lot. That's probably our biggest privilege is to be able to take up the baton when we want to, not hold it all the time. And I'm working on that one. Thanks, Cheryl. Stephanie, wanted to add? Um, I loved what you said, Cindy, because I, I, I always thought I was like a pretty woke person. I'd like to think that about myself. Um, and this past, you know, whatever months it's been, um, I'm learning how unwoke I am. Um, but I think, uh, Mike, the things, the two things that came up for me are just the fact that we are having these conversations and we're sitting here week after week doing this. This is something that I wish I had already been doing for 20 years. Um, so I, there's a part of me that feels super sad that all this time had been wasted, but there's nothing we can do about that. Um, so to me, like, this is pretty huge. And, but the thing that opened my eyes the most was when Cindy showed us the video about how black people have been kept out of neighborhoods and 
from purchasing houses and having that wealth passed down through generations. And I don't know what it was about that, but to me, that was a, that was an eye opener because where you live and your house and passing the house down, it just seems like the biggest thing that, that you, that people have, that I don't know how you could ever catch up from that. And I never, ever thought about it before. Um, so that was an eye opener for me. So thank you for asking that question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Stephanie. Kitty? Um, see if I can formulate the millions of things rushing around in my head. Um, I think that in this last year, because for me it actually started before it got intensified with everything that has happened since March and um, since uh, the horrible and unfortunate death of George Floyd. But even before that, um, having a cup, an opportunity to uh, hear Amira Magoji speak and Val Weiss speak last year and Cindy uh, last year, there were several things that were said that kind of, um, oh, made me think, oh. And I think um, before then, I thought, um, I, I'm a, a, a Montessorian, I'm a peacemaker, I'm a um, person who believes in kind of the connectedness of all humanity and the oneness and that, you know, at, at the core we're, you know, we're all spiritual beings and all, all of that great stuff that is who ha I have been really since I was very young. And in this last, and particularly in these last months, I realized that those beliefs are not enough. That um, uh, it, it, yes, at the core, I believe we're all one. But there's a whole group of of this of us that don't get the same privilege. And I think having uh, I've really become. Uh, I, before that, I, I would hear white privilege and think. Well, I'm not, I don't think I'm privileged. And uh, hearing story and seeing story after story, it, both in these talks and other workshops I've done more recently, um, posts I've read on Facebook where uh, Black people would explain just simple little things that happen. Well, see, they, they seem little to me, but, but at the same time, it, it struck me how if you keep having these things happen, over and over again where uh, people are, because you're black, it, whatever, whatever is happening to you, it really helped me understand uh, how privileged I have been and um, that I have a responsibility to um, help tear down these walls and help give everyone the same privilege that I have had. And it may take a while, but we all need to work at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not seeing any more hands up right now. Oh, uh, I Karen, got her hand yeah. up. Who, who did you see? Karen. Karen, Karen. I'm sorry, Karen. Karen and, and Kathleen. Kathleen. And then Kathleen, I see that now. Okay, thank you. Um, this is something coming from, I was watching the news this morning and there were two people on very differing perspectives regarding sort of the, the climate of our culture and liberal and illiberalism and conservatism and conservative illiberalism. And it was very interesting, but um, the, uh, the, cha the challenges that we face of our population to imagine a different kind of future. And I, been thinking frequently as the discussion's been going on um, about many different things, but also, I don't know if any of you ever watched Star Trek, The Next Generation. And this is, I, I don't mean to make light of this at all. It's, it's seeing our, a future possibility of where we could go. Now, of course, I know Captain Picard is white and I know Riker is white. And um, it, 
but but seeing and imagining a civilization or society in the future with story and narratives, new narratives, where we can see on television with more people who don't necessarily take an interest in understanding this in the way that we're here to try to understand it. Um, in order, it's almost like we, the, the, is our government going to lead us and create this new kind of way of looking at things and to create a new story for us? Or is it our political, is it our um, sort of entertainment world, popular culture kind of world that's going to help create that new image? Is it, um, I'm not on social media or Facebook, so I'm not sure what kind of power that has to, to, to transform and to change things. Um, and again, just sort of the way that being able to be open-minded to want to learn about different ways of doing things, different ways of understanding things, different ways of uh, practicing traditional cultures, et cetera, et cetera. You know, that's what, and again, it's sort of silly, but that's what Star Trek did for me is that it, it made me curious and made me want to understand more about differences. Um, and I don't know where that is in our society right now, um, but maybe it's a, a call for new filmmakers, a call for new storytellers to, to start imagining that new future. And a call for Montessorians. <laughs> Kathleen? Big time. Uh, <clears throat> this is just a follow up on Cory Booker. Um, I heard him interviewed on uh, some talk show and when he was finished, or as he was finishing up, he said, um, I have a decision to make before I get in my car to go home. He said, I have to drive to Baltimore from DC, and I'd really like to change into some comfortable clothing. <clears throat> but that might cause someone to stop me because of the color of my skin. So I'll drive home in my suit and tie. And I, I it's, it's unthinkable. I, I just, it went right through me. It was, and I wonder how many people hear that and it didn't go right through them. It was just like, what is he talking about? You know, mm -hmm. to think that a congressman has to have that, play that in his head before he can go home after a long day's work. And it's, he's not alone, obviously, but it just really touched me and set me. And I just wanted to share that. Yeah, thank you. There, sorry. Kathy, I see Sarah's Sarah, hand. Sarah, go ahead. Echoing what you just said, Kathleen, there is an ad and I need to find it and, and, and be able to put it on this next week um, where you see this, yeah, this man, probably in his 40s, maybe maybe 30s, and he is wearing a, you know, got a hood on, he's got his, his child in his hand at one point, and they're walking the streets and in very casual clothes. And you see these reactions to him. You see one woman roll up her window, the daughter in the car tries to wave to the son and the mother takes her away. The next time you see the son, the father is teaching his son to swim in the swimming pool. Um, and somebody at this public pool looks askance at them. And you go through these, you know, probably three, four, five scenarios of this man being looked down on, seriously looking, you know, just aside, all those little things. No one ever talks to him, but you know that he is being made less than. And you walk, you see the last images you see, or you see a a courtroom door opening. And, and the filmmaker has made it very clear that you're thinking that this man is walking out as, as, the, as the person who will be tried. And he, he, he turns to the left and sits down and you realize he's the judge. And it was, it was on, I, it was some television show that got lots of, of um, maybe it was, I don't know, it was some television show that got lots of, of airtime. And it was this wonderful representation of stop underestimating the people you see on the street. This is this this man is is uh, not who you're in, of, of painting a brush that he is. And it was a really great um, eye opener for I think a lot of people. I I applauded it because I thought that's what we need to see more of. If we're going to change the landscape, if we're going to change the misperceptions, 
um, Kathleen, to your point, we need to start representing the realities of, of, of lives of our black citizens, which is very diverse, all the way from artists to judges to doctors to uh, to parent, you know, to a stay at home mom to it, you know, anyway, it's, it's all there. So. Thanks, Mike, go ahead, you can unmute. Oh, and then I see Tanya Melville, you weren't on my screen, but now I see that you have your hand up. So Mike, go ahead and then we'll go to Tanya. It's kind of, Sarah just said something that kind of popped into my head. Um, you know, I, I like, I, I have, I have white heroes, like I have a ton of white heroes. Um, I, I love Steven Spielberg, I do. I just think the guy is walking on water. Um, I love Winston Churchill, you know, um, I, I consider myself English, I, I grew up there. Uh, when I grew up, they taught me British history and um, I learned all about uh, the ups and downs of my country and I love Winston Churchill, I like Carl Sagan, he's a hero of mine. And I can say that openly, you know, but like, I'm 50 and I have white friends. I've had a million conversations and I don't know that, and these conversations have come up. I don't know that any of their heroes are black or colored, like uh, just in normal conversation. I'm not pitting this on anyone. I'm just saying it's just natural to talk about these things and um, to kind of tie that point together uh, a couple of years ago when uh, Black Panther came out, I was um, working in a corporate environment and you know, the movie was just slaying the box office. It was doing literally billions. And so I'm going around, I'm excited. I'm a Marvel fan. I know there are at least 20 Marvel fans, male and female. And I'm saying, did you see Black Panther? You know, and it's, it's, I kid you not, like my white friends, my white colleagues, were, no, haven't gotten around to it yet. This thing's making billions. It seems so silly. Now I thought, you know, I didn't think anything of it until I got to maybe the 12th, 13th person. No, haven't seen it yet. I haven't seen it now, Marvel. Everyone's seeing these movies. And if, you're, if you enjoy the genre, it's just, it's, it's, it's in the law. You just go, L-O-R-E, it's in the, in the law. You just go and see Black Panther. And I just thought it was odd that none of my white colleagues had seen Black Panther. And I'm like, well, it's like heroin here. Somebody's doing it, but nobody's saying who. You know, like, I couldn't, I couldn't find out who. Now, small, silly little thing there, but somebody asked last week, the last question, what can we do? What, 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 what can we do to just make this right? What, what's the answer? I, I would love to see some white, some of our white children, our color, our non, you know, children that aren't black. I'd love to hear them just naturally say that some of their heroes are, are black, maybe, you know, uh, people of color, just naturally without coercion. I'm not talking about Martin Luther King on the stamp, you know, type heroes, not that he wasn't a hero, but I would love to see that process because it's, 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 I, I think, it, you know, we just need to naturalize the process, just like what Sarah was saying, you know, it's, it's, it's just something that I think would help. I agree. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And, and to, to the point of Cindy's challenge for, for books on the shelves, that's, that's, one of the, that's one of the ways, right, is to actually get representation on the shelves. Um, I was, she and was dedication of rooms in, in your school and dedication of student lockers everywhere you can do it. Yeah. There are a lot of, um, I, you know, I've been doing the research because I'm, I'm charged with, with getting the books for our school, expanding the library. Um, protagonists of color is what I'm calling them. But um, it, there's, there, there are um, autobiographies. There are, there are biographies and autobiographies of, of people of color who've done amazing things. There's one that I just purchased yesterday who this gentleman was um, a football player and an astronaut. One of the few who has done both, been able to throw a pass and, and uh, throw a pass on the moon, you know, up in, or up in space, he was on the space station. But it's like, it's awesome. Like that's a book for any child. That's not a book, it's, it's a young reader's um, autobiography, but um, I mean, a biography book, but it's just awesome to be looking at these books saying, if we can get these books out there, you know, the, the doctor who developed the pacemaker happened to be black. It would be awesome for somebody whose grandpa or grandma was saved by the pacemaker to go, that person is my hero, <laughs> because they know, you know? So, yeah. Sarah, in the uh, New York Times book review this past weekend, there is a new book just that 
that just came out called Black Heroes of the Wild West. By, uh, by James Otis Smith, <clears throat> Black Heroes of the Wild West. And the, and the title of the book review is Dismantling the Myth of the White Cowboy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I read that. Yeah, though I read the review. Well, a really good that. review. Yeah. In, uh, in Oakland, we have the Black Cowboys. Um, the Black Cowboys Association who operates, they provide horseback riding lessons to children of color and children of lower income. And, um, and they want the history of the Black Cowboys to, to be, to, to, to live, to continue. Yeah. Awesome. Tanya, you've been patient. Tanya Melville, go ahead and unmute. And then, and then we'll Anya also. Then Anya, and I think Nerver, did you have your hand up or you're good? Okay, we'll go to Tanya, thank you. Okay. Um, gosh, there's so many things I could talk about, but just what came to mind after listening to um, Mike and some others contribute today is that I watched, I watched a wonderful documentary yesterday evening as part of my relaxation, <laughs> but it really got me to thinking. Um, it's called My Octopus Teacher, if you haven't watched it. And what has resonated for me this afternoon is in watching that documentary, the fact that that free diver went down day after day after day in order to build the relationship. I don't think that it's something that we can do overnight, but it has to be persistent and it has to be consistent in terms of getting to know who we are in reflection of another person of color. Um, and I, you could either be the diver or you can be the octopus. And I think um, for, for me, I see myself as a little bit of both. Maybe I'm hiding a little bit in the cave and I'm putting a little tentacle out now and then. Um, and, and I think that it's a process and I'm glad to have this company here where I don't have to be in my cave all day long. Um, so I just wanted to bring that up. If you haven't watched the documentary, maybe you'll see what I'm trying to um, use as a metaphor for today. Uh, let's see, Anya, you wanna go? Thank you, Tanya. Um, I've been thinking about something I think um, Rosa is bringing up in the chat um, that I've been thinking about since, um, Sarah, you were talking about that, the commercial, and it's that idea almost that um, if you're Black, it's, it's like it's okay if and when you show and prove that you are a respectable person. Do you know what I mean? Like that idea that like, oh, let's see, he's a judge, whereas like, you know, I, 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 it's like hard for me to, to put into words, but I think about it when I, it may sound silly, but when I go to the grocery store and I'm like completely like in sweatpants and my hair's a mess and no makeup, you know, and I think I look like, oh, and I'm like, I can look like that and go into the grocery store and it doesn't matter. I'm a white lady, whatever. Whereas, you know, a black person, it's like, oh, they're either like, oh, are they a respectable or are they, you know, not? And then it's like, why is the not? not okay either and and so it's even, even that to me is that idea of white privilege and the idea that i feel like you know i i don't know obviously but like if i was a black person like i have to prove myself that i'm that i'm worthy and why should i have to prove that i'm worthy why can't i just be um and so i don't know i've been thinking about that a lot since that and that that i feel like is happens a lot and it's like yeah just the idea of just being needs to be okay Mm -hmm. And Nerea's next. Yeah, what Anya um, just said, it. I decided to jump back in. I put my hand up and then put it down again. But I was thinking of, uh, in answer to Mike's question, it's about, you know, what, what has triggered your um, your interest in these once and for me it's been you know over a couple of years of of waking up more to to what's going on um and learning a lot more and i just want to say that um the 
first book that was suggested to me that was like, oh, wow, there's a lot of American history that I didn't know anything about. Um, I was a book that was suggested to me at a Montessori conference. So it was like this Montessori world has been really important for me um, because it was the Montessorians for Peace and Justice at an AMS conference that, um, you know, just was an uh, introduction into many of these kinds of conversations. Um, but I don't have a lot of time for reading, but I have, a, before the COVID, I was spending a lot of time in the car, so I got into audio books. And I'll just say that hearing Black authors in Black voices, like reading their own work, has, has been really important to me. Uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates and um, Ibram X. Kendi, and this one, I just kind of came uh, across, which is a British woman, um, Rennie Edo Lodge, and wh why, I, why I'm no longer talking to white people about race. Oh. You know, what, what the, uh, the experience in their own voice has been really powerful. And the, the one thing that I hadn't really thought about that it's making me think about, is just the concept of assimilation. It's kind of like what Anya was talking about too, is like, you're acceptable if you've assimilated. <laughs> and act more white or something. Um, but the respect for, I don't know, there was something maybe in, it was in um, Tani Hesey Coates book of Beyond the World and Me of just talking about his black experience and his, the black culture and, um, and also in, in how to be an anti-racist of just like, it doesn't have to be about assimilation and that this white standard that we have of, of how everybody should be. And I've been thinking a lot about that lately. And, and um, these authors have, have been important for me, that a part of that exploration. Mm. Thank you. don't see any more hands up. Okay, so I want to tell you that um, our time is almost up and I asked one question. Oh. And I think we thought, I think we listened, I think we connected. Um, and I, I think that's, that, that's the way to reflect. That's the way to do the work. So that was, that was really wonderful. Um, I'm going to share uh, something and then, um, Sarah, if we can go to the um, YouTube clip. Um, it was in the news, and I was going to show you the article, but uh, I've mentioned before that I went to a high school called Lowell in San Francisco, and Lowell High School is a public high school that somehow, um, it's not a charter school, um, and it was many, many years ago that I went there, but it has also required, always required a certain grade point average in order to be able to get in. Um, I think it's 3.8, something like that, that you have to have in order to get into law. And that, that's not what you should be able to do in a public school. Um, it should be able to take in anybody, and Lowell has never had to take in everybody. It's in a part of San Francisco in the Sunset District that is a much nicer area of San Francisco. Um, property taxes are higher, so much more money goes to the school because of that. That's a different conversation about what that does for children of color in lower income neighborhoods. Um, and it's surprising that my family even knew about it. Um, but um, I went there, I graduated earlier than than any other student in my class, for sure. I was 16, everybody else was 18. Um, and, and I've mentioned that I was never brought into the counselor's office to learn about how to go to college or to apply or things like that, but all of the other students were. Um, and I was probably one of maybe three, if there were three. I don't remember seeing any other children, any other African-American children, but um, there may have been three that were there. So Lowell was in the news this past week because 
Lowell is going to allow students in based on lo a lottery. And I was thrilled that they finally, as long as it has taken, that they finally have done something to, to straighten up that problem with racism um, and um, ineligibility in schools. However, the reason why, and the article says it very clearly, the reason why they're doing the lottery system is because there are no grades in San Francisco because of COVID. And so there weren't any spring grades that they could base it on in order to allow students in. And so parents are furious um, that their children are not getting in based on their academic merit. Um, and so there's this big hoopla that's going on in San Francisco over the fact that um, Lowell is going to allow students in on the lottery. And what their response was back to parents, which was just embarrassing to me having gone to the school was we didn't do it to you our board didn't do it to you covid did it to you and as soon as all of this is over then we'll put it back the way that it was and i thought are are you hearing yourself are you he hearing that what you are saying is that your racist admissions policies were changed because they had to be changed because you had no choice. And as soon as you can go back to it, you will. And I thought, what? that is just absolutely unacceptable and embarrassing. And embarrassing that they didn't catch that they're racist. We really, really do. Uh, and as soon as we can again, we will. I mean, it's like, oh my gosh. Um, I can comment because I no longer I no longer live in San Francisco, but um, I certainly will comment to the newspaper if I can't comment to Lowell. Anyway, I just need to an alumni. Put alumni that out to always you. can comment, right, Cindy? You're an alumni. So one would think so. I don't know if um, for this this they're having a public comment period. So I'm going to find out if I can, but I think that's absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, Sarah, will you share this video about what it means to be white? There's, there's two of them actually, I think, or two parts of it. So let me ask people this question. What are you and where are you from? I mean, I'm white, I'm Caucasian, that is my heritage. Yeah, I find that really interesting because you know, white is not a country. I would just consider myself white American. When you say white, like what do you, what does that mean to you? White is the default, it's the default race. It's just the norm, it, to be white is the good thing. How would your life be different if you weren't white? I believe it could be different because uh, It's hard. I don't necessarily go outside of my group, so I don't know. Most white Americans do live in kind of a white bubble. The typical white American lives in a town that's more than three quarters white, and the average white person's group of friends is more than 90% white. White people usually are raised by white people. They hang out with white people, and so they're completely oblivious to issues of racism that impact non-white people. Thank you, Sarah. And the other one? Are you stuck? Hmm. 
Sarah, if you're stuck, you can just come out of it. Sorry, I wasn't stuck, I was muted. Uh, Cindy, the second clip ended at 304 and that's where I took you to. So there wasn't another one after Oh, you that. just went straight through. I thought something yeah. was wrong there. Okay, all righty. What did you think about that? What did you think about it's the default? What did you think about it's the good thing? <laughs> Mike, I see your face. <laughs> it reminded me of the doll test. Hmm. Yeah, anyone else? So, like, did it, go ahead, sorry. It sounded like those, it sounded like people that were speaking had a very little frame of reference of what it is to be excluded. Um, mm. It sounded like they were always, if not the popular person, you know, they felt, it sounded like they were received in a positive way um, and could not imagine anything other than that. Yes, and all the time, yes. So we learned last, oh, I'm sorry, Karen, go ahead. Uh, yeah, just quickly, because I've got the two kids that have gone through undergrad and, and, and grad school recently, and they've brought into my vocabulary through their work, things like he hegemony and hegemonic <laughs> ways of being where the studies that are happening, at least in what they're studying and what they're doing is realizing what these constructs are and calling them for what they are. Uh, it's sort of like a metacognitive ability at the social level now where people are becoming so much more aware, at least perhaps in the universities uh, by professors who are teaching this to help us see that we're caught in this story. Um, and, and maybe by seeing it, we can start getting out of it or changing it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Liza, was your hand up? No. Okay. This is Tanya. I was, I was, and sometimes as an immigrant, I step back and I look at something and I go, hmm. I was surprised at their lack of vocabulary to, ex to express anything beyond what the question was asking. Uh, mm. it, it was so indicative of there's this closed construct that, they, that no one has thought beyond the construct of what matches them being a white person. You know, they, they couldn't even have the vocabulary to describe it. Hmm. So last week we talked about um, the second part of race as a social construct. And we included some of the history of the creation of white as a race um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a little bit of review, but I'm gonna probably give you another little bit of review next week since our time is almost up. Um, but what we definitely learned was that there was a time when there was no race, um, when people were just not divided that way. Um, and I think I gave you some reference that the ancient Greeks um, knew that the ancient Persians were a little darker than they were, but they didn't consider that a different race. Um, they just knew that they were differently colored. Um, there wasn't that kind of racial identifier. Um, not there, not ancient Europe. Um, in Britain, there were a plethora of races. Um, the Anglo-Saxons, Norse, Scots, Druids, and a lot of subgroups um, that you could, that were differently colored. Um, there were as many groups of people, and let me not use the word race, there were as many groups of people, different groups of people as there were languages, um, because lots of people separated out geographically or they formed their own languages of their geographical um, area. And when colonization began, 
they founded an, an identity where there were Christian men of European descent who started to be called something different according to their features or according to their culture. But before the Enlightenment, people... No, but, well, do I have to say anything? Did they take your temperature? Uh, we got, I need to... Okay, but before, before the Enlightenment, people classified themselves and others according to their clan or their tribe or their location or their, their religion or, or their affinity with particular kinds of identities. Um, and although people could see the difference, light skin, slightly dark, differences in religion, differences in cultural habits, differences in climate, et cetera, et cetera, there wasn't race. There wasn't that. So the term there was a, there was slavery at the time you were mentioning all Greeks and you were mentioning all the time there were no no races not not, not the talk of races but there was divide in in you know economical divide that actually is bringing the race to. There was definitely economical divide and this and. And little by little, yes, there was there was slavery of different peoples, definitely. Um, but the term white, white race, white people um, entered the European language in the 17th century. And that it connected with the Atlantic slave trade and the enslavement of Irish indigenous people and then and then Africans. And many scholars then came to the forefront as saviors of people because people who wanted to continue slavery wanted to be able to have someone justify their, um, their desire to enslave people. And so then Blumenbach, who was uh, um, called the father of, uh, of anthropology, um, he created this belief system based on different skulls. And what I didn't tell you was that um, he had the five different kinds of skulls. His favorite one was the skull of a woman, a uh, German woman, um, who had been involved in, in sex slaves uh, trade is what, what we're told. Um, and that uh, the skull was, skulls at that time were given to him because it was a part of what he was researching. And so a lot of people would bring him skulls. And his favorite one was the one of this woman. And they found that skull in the carcass of mountains. Um, hence, Caucasian. And so that's where he coined that term from because of where that skull was found and that he felt it was the most beautiful skull out of all of the rest of them and used that as his example of what should be considered superior. And then continued his, his own writing and his own scholarly information that then fed people who needed it to be able to say to people, ah, this is in a, 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 the superior race, these are the inferior races, and we need to separate them out, and we need to use the ones that are inferior for our benefit so that we can continue to raise up a group of people who are superior, um, and, and eventually that we can create the, the America that we want the colonies to end up becoming. So this was before the Enlightenment period, and then um, on and on. I would say that would not was not so enlightened, enlightening. <laughs> but what's interesting about it is that what came out of the ideal was the concept of white being better. So it was not just the race, but along with the separation of races, also came that that idea of superiority and inferiority. Um, and that it has made race the defining feature that has to do with, with what is not true, but has led us down the line of separating the races out. And I'm gonna just read you a quote 
um, that says the white race is a fiction created by aggressive colonization, colonization and slavery in the colonies destined to become the United States. The European colonists found themselves pitted against decision involving indigenous people while they're enslaving Africans. In between these two colors of red and black, the white race um, created its own antithetical identity that distinguished the supposed rightful owners from the slaves who were the so-called primitives. It's too easy to think of Irish, Italian, Slavic, or Greek immigrants and their children as becoming white, but that rhetorical construction ignores how Americans thought about whiteness before the 1940s. Then, Race scientists and ordinary people thought there were several white races, such as Celtic, uh, Northern Italian, Eastern European, Southern Italian, etc. And people were ranked from high to low according to who they were. Um, and so, so I, I just want to say that, and this is a, where I'm going to end this piece, and then I'll pick it up next next um, week. That. There, there was a, a, a real careful sorting out because not only was there the creation of the races, but then the subdivisions as to who was whiter or less white um, were also created and changed, and changed. And so there were some people who weren't white before who became white and some people who were white before who were no longer white. All of that, um, is a construct. All of that is a construct. Um, and what it did as well as fed into a horrible situation that involved slavery and the continuation of racism was also to deny people who were white from the understanding of their true heritage. And that's a piece that I want you to think about because, because a lot of heritage was lost. And when you can start to peel away information about people and to understand the commonalities that are cultural, that are geographic, then, then you, you, you help yourself to be able to eliminate the race that separates you and discover the culture that connects you. Does that make sense to you? Mm -hmm. and, and so two, two sets of people lost out. Um, one of them ended up with a horrible, horrible continuation of, of traumatic situations. Um, but everyone lost, everyone did. And I don't want to minimize what happened to people who were Africans, and I don't minimize that. But I do think that it's important for you to get both of those pieces to understand that, that somewhere in the willingness to sacrifice Africans and other people of color in creating races, it was also the willingness to sacrifice people who were identified as white and their own heritage. So I'm going to leave us with that thought. Um, and Sarah, I have a, Sarah, did we decide that it's politically correct to play that song? Oh, yes, I think it's fine. Do you want me to put up the link for the homework or is that, are we going to save that for next Oh, week? would you? Yes, yes, yes. You have homework. Sorry. <laughs> Sarah's going to put it in the chat. So please save your chat. Or just, if you want to, you can just highlight that and, and put it in your mail and send it to yourself even. That's an easy way to put it on your to-do. Yeah, and I will tell you that it's very long. Um, so, but it's, it's a piece that I think is very interesting and that I would love for you to, um, to listen to. It's called Whiteness, WTF, White Privilege and the Invisible, Invisible Race. And now we're going to share the song. Hold on, let me figure out. Yeah, and let me just tell you that um, it is an, a new take on a patriotic song. 
and I'm having Sarah started in the middle because it's very long. So I just wanted you to, I want you to listen to and pay attention to the words. I, it was the wrong video. I was going to say, oops, is that it? No, that was not, that was definitely not it. <laughs> I did something wrong. There we go. Do you have it, Sarah? I do. Okay. And Cindy, people are asking where you got that, um, what, what you were reading from the source that you were giving us that information, that background information, if we could put that in the chat as well. Oh, okay. sure. <laughs> Thy immigrants who hail from every land. Their hope and heart and diligence like gifts from God's own hand. America, America. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, that video was to just say that we're all, we're, we're all on this planet and we will not separate each other. That's our work. It is, and thank you for leading us in that work. And thank you to all of you who give up this precious time in your schedule to come and be a part of this every week. Thank you. We look forward to seeing you again next week. Thank you so much to Sarah Lavelli and to Dr. Cindy Acker. Thank you very much. See you everybody next week. Happy I'm sorry. Friday. I think Stephanie had her hand up. Oh, sorry. Definitely. Oh, no, I was saying thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, oh, absolutely. And we're going to have a chat today about timing. Um, yeah, yeah, just a, a brief chat about that. Okay, all right. All right, thank you, everybody. Thank you. 
I missed part of the rec.